It's Sunday, January 15, 2023. Welcome to the 47th episode of The Weekend Show, where we take a deep dive into the news of the week. Please also subscribe to the 5-Minute News OG Daily Briefing. It's a podcast on iTunes. Get it there or wherever you get yours. Joining us today is a former Deputy Assistant Director of the FBI's Counterintelligence Division, who led the investigation into Russian interference in the 2016 election. He was chief of the division's counter-espionage section and led the investigation into Hillary Clinton's use of a personal email server. He's author of the bestseller Compromised, Counterintelligence and the Threat of Donald J. Trump. Peter Strzok, welcome to The Weekend Show. Anthony, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me on. So it's a few years since you uh, were walked out of the FBI building, effectively, and uh, you, um, I think everybody knows the story behind what happened with you, and you, uh, in a nutshell, you, you sent personal text messages that have been weaponized by Republicans to suggest that you made it look like the FBI was going to stop Donald Trump from getting elected, but of course you were talking on a personal level. And I first want to start this conversation by saying I completely believe you. And uh, I think the way that they've kind of used that, because it's so obvious to anybody who like lives in reality of, of that conversation that you were having with Lisa Page via text message. So I, I just want to kind of get that out of the way, because I do feel that there's so much kind of history attached to that. And, and you know, people will have their own views. And I've watched you on the stand like four years ago being interviewed by... Um, by Republicans, and they they really have weaponized that. Do you just want to give me a, a quick uh, response to that kind of period in your life before we talk about what's happening in the news this week? Yeah, well, I think the easiest way to describe it was a traumatic experience. I mean, I, I've never experienced it, anything even close to it, and hope never to do it again. It's not something I would wish on my worst enemy, but it was certainly at the time. You know, this was... There had been a buildup. I mean, you know, during the campaign trail, President then candidate Trump at various times was either lauding or demonizing the FBI for either their action or failure to act on the Clinton email server investigation. So between that, his attacks on Comey and then became attacks on me were something that, you know, when you have that sort of personal experience of somebody, you know, the president of the United States, arguably the most powerful man in the world, who is singling you out, you know, I'm not some political appointee. I'm not a senator. I'm not some rich, you know, captain of industry. I'm just a kind of mid-level executive in the government. And to be signaled out, singled out like that in a way that, you know, doesn't have a precedent in our nation's history, at least, was extraordinarily disconcerting. And I think the other thing is, you know, looking back now, you know, four years removed, four and a half years removed, <laughs> kind of, yes, there were personal expressions, but I think most of them have been proven to be absolutely true, objectively. I mean, the man was a threat to the, you know, the functioning of a you know, well-functioning democracy in the United States. He was trying to and did drive a wedge between the United States and our NATO allies. He did have this strange fascination in cozying up to dictators, whether it's Vladimir Putin or Kim Jong-un. But the things that I expressed, one, were not unique. I mean, people all across the political divide in America, even Republicans were saying the sorts of things about Trump in private. But when you look back now, you know, to sit there and say, you know, one, there have been all these looks at the sort of conduct of the investigations, which have all concluded that it was done well, whether that's the inspector general or, you know, countless uh, U.S. attorneys or congressional committees who tried to find something and didn't. So one, that work was done well, but two, sort of the conclusions that, well, you know, there's a fair argument that Trump is a racist, is a misogynist, is, you know, in it for the financial aspects of personal self-enrichment. So those personal sort of beliefs, you know, do very much sort of coincide with the truth as we were seeing it played out in the years that followed. People don't really understand, because I get this as well, it's not quite on the same level as yours, but people say to me, you know, because I, I do a, a daily uh, unbiased news program that is non-partisan but it still criticizes people if they have done wrong or even it reports on people if they have done wrong because I think what right-wing media tends to do is they just don't report on the story if it makes their people look bad. I am able to be completely objective when I do that show and I as a journalist and I think journalists all over the world in the same way that FBI agents you have your your training and the cause is that you want to do what is right. You want to tell the truth. And 
sure, you're going to upset one side or the other occasionally, but you're, you are drawn to the truth. Now, you were a military man before you went into the FBI. Just explain the kind of mindset of people like yourself who, are, who have a, a career and a, and a vocation that is so deeply rooted in service. Yeah, no, I think it's a, a, a first a great analogy that you make in terms of the way that you know journalists approach their job in terms of objective objectively reporting on things. While at the same time, the question of whether or not you can have personal beliefs and personal beliefs that are at odds or have an opinion about what you're supposed to be objectively reporting. So, I mean, it's very much in my experience the same sort of thing of what I experienced in the FBI. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about um, the military uh, before or later on, but certainly within the bureau, you know, by and large, the FBI is a very, very conservative organization. I mean, there's a reason, you know, the phrase "law and order." <laughs> when you look at the FBI, well, that is law and order. I mean, they are the people who are going out there doing the investigation, looking at violations of law, working with the Department of Justice to prosecute people when merited. So, to the extent that if you have an idea that there's some sort of party that has a stronger affinity to the idea of law and order. Historically, in the United States, at least in the 20th century, that's been the Republicans. Now, that's not to say there aren't strong law and order Democrats. And you think back to people like Sam Nunn or, you know, folks that, very, you know, kind of traditional, uh, you know, there there is a space in the Democratic Party for, you know, conservative values and law and order values. But traditionally, law and order, support for the military is something, at least in the past couple of generations, we've associated with the Republican Party. So you see that in the FBI, that, again, it's a very conservative organization, but it's not... It's not, I, I did not know the political leanings of the people I worked with at any point in my career, whether as an analyst, as a case agent, as a supervisor, as an executive. It's just not the kind of thing where you come in and, you know, start having a, you know, conversation across the table about, hey, you know, what do you think about who's running for senator or for office in any way? It just doesn't come up. And so the culture of the organization is, you know, that that, that just is something that, again, when it comes to doing your work, you very much are approaching the case or the investigation in front of you with an eye to what are the facts. My worry was always, you know, as much or even more, not so much is somebody going to be biased towards seeing things that support their worldview, but are they going to overcompensate? And are they going to say, I feel a certain way, so I'm going to give the other side more of a benefit of the doubt than I should. And that if, if anything, the skewing would be too much to the other side. And just, you know, again, but that constant sort of, you know, everything drilled down into the cultural ethos is a sort of you know, going out and finding the facts that's backed up by the regulations that are created to help do that. That's backed up by independent people like the inspector general and congressional oversight to make sure it is objective. And then the other thing is there's nothing the FBI isn't a one person or you, you can't do anything as one person. I mean, you work cases frequently as a team. You have supervisors. Decisions are made not in any sort of isolated context, but you have this whole surrounding infrastructure that plays a role in that decision making. So even if somebody wanted to sort of pursue, you know, what the Republicans are calling a deep state agenda, you couldn't do that. You, you couldn't. They, they just... The context of the organization and all the players, you wouldn't be able to to, to pull that off. And so, backing out to the, the the other aspect of your question in the military, you know, I started my career in the army as an officer, and that very much was an even stronger separation of politics from the job. And there were some people. I mean, we'd get into you know philosophical debate about whether or not, because at the end of the day, you serve the commander in chief, who's the president. And that if that commander in chief tells you, I'm going to deploy you and go to war and you need to fight and potentially give the life and the life of those soldiers under your command, is having any sort of political belief consistent with doing a good job in that context? And there's some people who didn't vote, who said, you know what, I, I, I don't think it is appropriate for me to vote if I am serving whoever it is. And if I vote against somebody who ends up being the president, you know, is that consistent? And my perspective always was, yeah, it's completely consistent. I mean, that's the complexity of democracy. We should go in there. Everybody casts the vote. Your candidate might win. Your candidate might lose. But at the end of the day, the greater ideal is that you're going to serve the selection of who the people have chosen. And, you know, again, when you, it's interesting, too, when you look certainly at the higher line, and I've left as a captain, but when you look at senior general officers, just the very strong separation and the desire, you know, just the, when General Milley, you know, essentially was hoodwinked into marching with Trump across Lafayette Square after they cleared the protesters who Trump could hold up the Bible in front of the church, the discomfort that Milley had 
in doing that that he expressed after the fact some of the things that he was saying to you know in interviews with the January 6th committee you see that strong sort of historical ethos of absolutely yeah, the loyalty keeping... was very impressive with him wasn't it i mean arguably millie saved us from world war 3 so you know <laughs> i think we have to uh, with hindsight thank him and i i thought it was interesting how you know trump wanted him struck off for you know his communications with China and Biden was like no 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 this is exactly what we need these are the protections that are built in to government and and it also occurred to me recently that whenever Trump or his his uh, cohorts refer to the deep states what they're actually referring to is just the government yeah exactly and i think you know i think it was david frum that said you know if you substitute the phrase the rule of law every time you see the deep state it all makes sense. Yeah. And I, I agree with that. I mean, I think that's the, you know, the fine way to think about it. I mean, this isn't the, the, the deep state. Look, there is if you and the problem is that, you know, it's like effective propaganda, like any falsehood in propaganda. There's always a seed of some element of truth there that seizes that. That's what creates the power. It's not just an utter lie. There's something underlying it that makes it like, well, that makes sense. Now, there is. I mean, the United States bureaucracy is huge. Some of that is very, very good. Some of that prevents corruption. But there's also an element of like, you know, it takes on a life of its own. It may be a little bit too large. There are legitimate criticisms. And so you, you get these people like, you know, the ideologues like Steve Bannon, who sees on the deep state and just, I mean, I think he's a nihilist at the end of the day. I think he just wants to utterly dismantle the entirety of the bureaucratic state, put in loyalists at every level and have them absolutely do whatever the leader says. I mean, that's that's authoritarianism. It's not a democracy. But I think certainly what we see now when you hear the far right, in particular, say the deep state, they are talking about a professional bureaucracy that is not as corruptible as they would like it to be. Um, and, and I say corruptible in the context of doing what they want ahead of doing what the law requires. And particularly, you know, I grew up overseas and my father was in the military and then went into international development and spent a lot of time growing up in the third or developing world. And you were educated looking, in Iran, was it? Iran and then in West Africa. And it was upper voltage, not Burkina Faso and Haiti traveled all over West Africa. And, and you look at countries, democracies, or countries trying to be democracies and the large how you create governments that are legitimate and in particular how beneath the leader how you create government structures that are as free as corruption as possible how you create bureaucracies that are both well functioning and that adhere to the rule of law you know that aren't doing what the leader says but who are doing what whatever the version of constitution or governing governing documents say they should that's an extraordinary challenge. And I don't know that a lot of people, certainly in the United States, understand how really impressive in general, despite all its successes and problems and, you know, slowness, the big B bureaucracy of the United States, how effective and good it is. Because, you know, a lot of it, you know, yes, you can go to Western Europe, you can go to Japan, you can go to, you know, other, other nations, and certainly they're even better functioning, arguably, than the United States. But there are a huge number of nations that aren't, where corruption mm. is just rampant, where people would have no understanding of how just the basic services of, you know, trying to leave a country and get a stamp in your passport without putting, you know, the equivalent of twenty dollar bill on the passport and you hand it over to the visa or the control officer. All these little things that we take for granted are because of the quote unquote deep state. And, you know, dismantle that at your peril. And it's again, I, I'm I'm sorry that folks don't understand that. I'm sorry that it's not easier to see what the alternative is. And I do worry about, I mean, we saw it during the Trump administration. The things we take for granted are not as durable as we probably believe when it comes to governance. I mean, there is, there is a thin veneer there. And it's not, you know, it's not our birthright that we have this great, vibrant, well-functioning democracy. It takes work and it's, you know, if you're not constantly sort of building it up, it's easy to start losing it very, very quickly. Let's look at uh, some of the crazy stuff that's happened this week. I would love there for a week to go by in the United States where crazy stuff is not on the front pages of the newspapers. But um, we've seen it this week uh, with the Attorney General Merrick Garland on Thursday. He's appointed a special counsel 
to investigate the presence of classified documents found at President Joe Biden's home in Wilmington, Delaware, and at an unsecured office in Washington dating back to his time as vice president. Um, I also want to look at uh, Ukraine and and obviously the war there, the the Russian invasion of Ukraine, and look at... uh, some of the, the the strategy, but also from this side of the uh, of the border to kind of understand why there is an increasing number of Republicans who don't want to continue funding, uh, you know, the equipment for that war. Um, and then finally, we'll look at uh, Friday's news that uh, Trump's company was fined one point six million dollars for a scheme in which the former president's top executives dodged personal income taxes on lavish job perks. A symbolic but hardly crippling blow for an enterprise boasting billions of dollars in assets. I would just say, though, it is the maximum allowed by law, that fine, uh, and they have 14 days with which to pay it. Um, let's start with kind of Merrick Garland and, and Joe Biden and this, you know, uh, there is a special counsel currently, Jack Smith, who is investigating the Donald Trump documents situation. And this is hundreds of documents in boxes and boxes. In fact, there's even video images of those boxes being removed from the White House and being taken to Mar-a-Lago. Um, uh, very, you know, uh, hardly secure in itself, you know. And and the difference. Let's just talk about the differences between Trump's theft of documents and Biden's uh, mislaying of documents, or he claimed he didn't even know he had them. Uh, with your perspective as a former FBI agent, I mean, how, how do you see these two cases? Well, I see them as very different. Um, you know, they're, they're both obviously serious in the context that classified information needs to be protected appropriately. And certainly when you start talking about top secret information, information which is termed sensitive compartmented information, which it looks like we, we know that Trump had, and it sounds like from media reporting that uh, President Biden did as well, that's material that has you know very strong controls placed on it. So anytime it doesn't, isn't maintained in the place and manner that it should be, there's risk and you know potentially human lives that are placed at risk or very extraordinary collection mechanisms of you know overhead satellites or you know very sensitive sort of intercept capabilities that could be placed at risk. So it's a serious matter. Now the fact of the matter is. Mishandling of classified information goes on, unfortunately, in the federal government almost on a daily basis. I mean, was that the FBI in charge of the counter espionage section on a monthly, sometimes weekly basis? We would get calls from various agencies around the U.S. government saying, hey, an employee, you know, left their lock bag of information on the metro. They accidentally left something behind in a restaurant. They found stuff at home that they shouldn't have had. I mean, just the litany of things where people accidentally mishandle things is a frequent, unfortunately, uh, event. The question then becomes, okay, so when does that become, and, and they're dealt with typically in an administrative sort of way. Now, people absolutely may face sanctions, right? They may have you know a letter of censure or some sort of worse administrative punishment they might be docked or given a fine or suspended for work or even lose their security clearance in really you know significant cases but that's all not in a criminal context that's all in the context of you know doing things that were not in accordance with regulation and so the question is when does it become criminal and you know one of the things we did you know that is consistent with the things we did prosecute but it came to a head looking at Hillary Clinton's use of a private email server, has said, you know, can we identify and characterize those times where the Department of Justice has chosen to prosecute people for mishandling? And so we went back and we literally looked at every single time the Department of Justice has ever prosecuted somebody for mishandling classified information. And when they did, there were typically four categories. And, you know, I know people have a wide variety of opinions about what Director Comey did when he made the announcement about the results of Hillary Clinton's investigation and as well as what happened later in the fall. But if you go to that speech on July 5th, he does a great job of laying out those categories. And it's essentially, you know, in cases where there's an extraordinary volume of information, we're not talking hundreds of documents, we're talking, you know, Edward Snowden or Chelsea Manning volume type, you know, just hundreds and hundreds, thousands of pieces of information. That's one category. Another category is when you see somebody who's actively obstructing the investigation, where they are destroying things, where they're lying to agents, where they're you know, doing things which are making it harder to get to the truth of the investigation. Another category is, are there unauthorized parties involved? You know, is there a foreign power that is involved in receiving this? Is there a journalist that's receiving this? So all of these things speak to 
sort of a knowledge and an intent of the person who mishandled the information that they were doing wrong and yet they continued to do wrong. So then, you know, back out of that and say, okay, what do we have with Trump and what do we have with Biden? What, you know, we still are learning what we do or don't have with Biden. Well, with Trump, you know, one, he had information that he was made aware that he had information. And over the span of a year and a half, there was this evolving what started as a negotiation, which took, in my opinion, way too long, which ended up with 12, 14 boxes being returned to the archives. Then subsequently, intervention by the Department of Justice saying, we think you have more information you haven't returned that's classified. Eventually getting a little bit under threat and actual presence of a subpoena, which then still wasn't there, leading to a search warrant that recovered a bunch more classified information. And then finally at the tail end of it, you know, finding even yet more in the storage locker that he had down in Florida. But the important so thing despite there, it being signed off, that's the other thing. Isn't right. It? And the, then, right. The Trump and then a lawyer lo- signed a document to say we've given everything back and stuff was found still after that. Right. And stuff found, particularly in the context of the search warrant, this wasn't something that was just, you know, boxes pushed away somewhere that there's no indication that anybody opened. Things found in Trump's study. Right. Things found among Trump's current papers. This wasn't just stuff that got, you know, boxed up like everybody has when you move. And inevitably, maybe there are a couple of boxes you have in your basement that you never quite get to opening up. This is things that he had in his office that on a day to day basis he was using and going through and was aware of. So, you know, when you take that sort of current present knowledge coupled with this, what appears to be allegedly active You know, some indication that he may have told people working with him to move material out of the places that were going to be searched. But this active variety of attempts to impede the government's recovery of it, that's what gives rise. And again, you saw that in the, you know, in the search warrant, the the crimes were one mishandling. But I think the more important crime was, you know, the obstruction of the government trying to get that information back. And I always say, don't when you look at Trump, don't think of this as mishandling of classified documents, featuring obstruction. At the core, think of this as an obstruction case, which happens to feature mishandling of classified documents. Because what makes this such egregious, in my opinion, alleged illegal, I think will be, hope we'll see, charged illegal behavior, it's the obstruction. It's the, these are mine. I declassified them, but none of my attorneys are going to certify that these were declassified. His knowledge that he shouldn't be doing it in all the attempts that he appears to have taken to prevent the government from getting this back. Now, compare that to what we know about Biden and the heavy, big, huge asterisk. We don't know all the details yet. Some of this obviously is still evolving. I initially thought, well, you know, one box in this temporary office space in DC, clearly an administrative error. But then we learned, you know, very recently that some material was recovered from his residence in, in Delaware. So I think there's a reasonable question, you know, uh, how widespread is this practice? Is there more classified information? And who, how did it come to happen? What is entirely different is the level, the, the absolutely full cooperation, apparently, on the part of Biden and his attorneys in his camp and working with the government. They discover it, they, all accounts, they immediately contacted the National Archives, they returned it, they've been fully cooperative with the Department of Justice. So when it comes to that sort of intent, the behavior behind the mishandling, it's apples and oranges. So, you know, do do I think, certainly given that second discovery for President Biden, that it is reasonable for a special counsel to be appointed to have an investigation? Probably. I mean, I think you could argue, but certainly in my mind, that, that second discovery sort of, in my mind, pushed it into the realm of, okay, you, you know, we, we, we do need a special counsel. But when you look at the the intentions behind that behavior, that you can, we can all see, uh, they're just entirely different. And they are the key and critical component to, in the past, what has the Department of Justice charged and what has the Department of Justice not charged? And it, it goes to the core of that question. And, you know, one in former President Trump's behavior absolutely is supported by what DOJ has criminally charged in the past. And again, in President Biden, at least what we publicly know, squarely goes to the side of, what the Department of Justice doesn't charge. So we'll see how it plays out. I, you know, I hope these things, I hope both of them move with some alacrity. I don't, you know, I don't want to see, I don't think most people want to see these, you know, dragging on for, for two plus years. Um, I suspect. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's useful though, isn't it? That you, you kind of both sides the issue. Merrick Garland is 
is clearly he doesn't want to give any ammunition to the Republicans who are going to criticize if there isn't a special counsel. So so by both sizing it, then you just leave it to the professionals to do their investigation. And then hopefully the truth will come out. And and maybe that's the difference between the the left and the right in in Washington is that, you know, one will be like, yeah, I mean, even with Hunter Biden, it's like investigate him, you know, do whatever you have to do. That's what Democrats are saying. That's what the president's saying, you know, investigate him. Whereas Republicans are like, why are you investigating Trump? Why did you, they call it a raid. Of course, it wasn't a raid. You know, they they knocked on the door with a with a with a document that was legal and did their search. I mean, it's it's not even. And the other thing I would say, which I only really thought about this morning, is that Mar-a-Lago is a is a public venue. I mean, you can buy tickets to go and have dinner with the former president. You know, you you any and I I one time you should do this. It's kind of fun. You look on Yelp and you search Mar-a-Lago. And you see reviews for the food and people like taking selfies and stuff. And I'm like, and whereas Joe Biden's residence, I guess it's going to be secure because, you know, he was the vice president and now the president. Yeah. And he made that point of saying, look, it's locked up by my Corvette or something. And I I, I understand what he's trying to do. I don't know that it did him much good to do that because it's almost agreed. Yeah. Y- you reach the point of protesting too much. But your point, the point he was trying to make, I think is absolutely right. I mean, this is something that was locked up that the public didn't have access to that, you know, certainly because he was a former vice president, had the Secret Service protective detail and in some way, shape or form around there. Compare and contrast that exactly what you're saying about Mar-a-Lago. I mean, people have uh, weddings there. They have anniversaries there. They have celebrations, bar mitzvahs, all kinds of things where you're bringing in caterers and florists and God knows whoever else who are coming in, bringing in the flowers, bringing in the food, bringing in the music, setting up all the stages. You know, who, who, if anybody is screening these folks, because if I am certainly a hostile intelligence service, does do the Russian intelligence services, the Chinese intelligence services, the Cuban intelligence services, would they like to get into the residence of a former president of the United States? 100%. They're going to try and do that. Certainly, you know, I don't know how far they'd go back, but certainly, you know, I would think from President Obama forward, a good intelligence service is going to try and get access to that. Now, if you have a sort of isolated place at Delaware, that is a much harder proposition than Mar-a-Lago, which is a country club where, you know, and there are these photos of this Russian-speaking Ukrainian woman who is, you know, an American immigrant. She was pretending to be yeah. a Saint European Marie Rothschild Bettina, and, and, and yeah. scammed her way onto the scene where she has then yeah. photographs on the golf course with President Trump and Lindsey Graham. And a year before that, we had a Chinese national who was picked up with multiple cell phones and store electronic storage devices. I mean, there is rampant successful targeting of Mar-a-Lago, which I think if the question becomes, compare the risk that this information was placed into... It's entirely greater, inarguably, at Mar-a-Lago just by the nature of what Mar-a-Lago is. And so, again, that adds to, from a counterintelligence perspective, from a risk perspective, you know, I'm much more concerned and worried about the information that was there than I am about what was, you know, at, at, at Biden's house in this office space. But again, that's why, you know, go to the investigation. Let, you know, and then to your point about, you know, the problem by playing by the rules, but it's been interesting to me is Merrick Garland bending over backwards to say, you know, we're going to let this Hunter Biden investigation run out led by a U.S. attorney appointed by Trump. And we're going to take this initial look at Joe Biden and we're going to sign it to this U.S. attorney in Chicago who was appointed by Trump. And then when we're going to create a special counsel, we're going to pick a special counsel who was appointed by Trump and who served as what the term is a PADAG, the Principal Associate Deputy Attorney General, which is a very political position within the Department of Justice reporting to the Attorney General and Deputy Attorney General for President Trump. So there's this bending over backwards to make sure that we're, we're going to placate the concerns of the Republicans by getting these historical Republicans to look at this. Now, compare and contrast that to Bill Barr when he had concerns about, I want to take a look at what the government was doing against our interests. Who did he pick? Did he pick Obama appointees? No, he picked Jeff Jensen, Obama appointee. He picked this guy, you know, the Western District of Pennsylvania, who was taking in the, the intake point for all this voting fraud stuff. He took, you know, John Huber, who's the Trump appointed U.S. attorney out in Utah. He took all these, you know, a Republican took all these Republican appointees to look at the concerns. So there is, and, you know, you play by the rules and you get the imbalance in this. So, again, I, I think probably... Attorney General Garland was doing the right thing. I think it points out just the horrendous abuse and hypocrisy of Bill Barr in particular and the way he abused the system. But there's clearly not, there there are not like-to-like behaviors between the administration's investigations of what they would see as, or outsiders would see as their opponents. 
Isn't it interesting how Bill Barr has like positioned himself as an authority <laughs> when he was, and he goes on the news now and he's interviewed and it's like, mm, 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 and it's like, are you kidding me? You got up on the stage and paraphrased the Mueller report to exonerate Donald Trump. Uh, so that nobody, knowing that no one was going to bother to read it because it was this thick, and so you you did it in like ten minutes, and everyone was like, "We'll take that version." I mean, right? That was a very slimy move, wasn't it? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, that's a common DC practice that you know people rehabilitate and rechrome themselves, and you know, Bill Barr is the uh, high level example of that. But you have any number of other people who are absolutely, you know, complicit in horrific abuses of, of whether it was. The, the Department of Justice, whether it was, you know, the separating children from their mothers at the southern border of the United States. There are just these horribly objectionable behavior that people signed up for and supported, whether they were in the press room, the policy room, wherever the case may be. And suddenly at the end, even despite all that, Trump's behavior became too much and they threw the flag. And now they're viewed, you know, somewhat as like, oh, not heroes, but certainly as well, they did the right thing. And no, they at the end, they may have done the right thing, but they spent the prior two years doing absolutely horrific things. And I think, you know, it it it, it is not surprising to me that Bill Barr would be trying to present himself this way. But absolutely, to your point, the things that were done ahead of time, you know, look at what the lengths he went to back away from the prosecution of Mike Flynn, the conviction of Mike Flynn. The things he did to back away from the sentencing of Roger Stone because, oh, he's just a, a doddering old man and he shouldn't go to jail. And then turn around and look at what both Roger Stone and Mike Flynn did around January 5th and 6th. So for Bill Barr to get up and, now and, both, and say and both vote requested was a legitimate well. vote. Well, yeah. bull. L you know, look at all the things yeah. you did to enable this chain of events that culminated in January 6th. You can't just mm. simply wash your hands of it on November 10th or December you know, 5th or whenever it was. You played an absolutely critical role in creating the conditions that allowed for an insurrection, a failed insurrection in the United States. It's like that game we used to play as kids where you go and ring, ring the doorbell and then you run away <laughs> so that when they open the door, there's nobody there. You know, that, that's kind of what Bill Barr did with, with January 6th. And he kind of facilitated everything, positioned himself in such a way that he was able to make a, a swift exit before anybody kind of looked in his direction. Let's just talk about some of the well, let's talk about Russia for a moment and the and these characters surrounding Donald Trump, because I think, you know, it really isn't fair to compare Biden and Trump. Biden, who spent his life in, in politics as a, you know, started out as a, a public defender and and then, you know, it's just basically given given his life to public service in the same way that, that you have. And it, and it certainly hasn't, you know, necessarily made him rich by by Donald Trump's standards. Um that that kind of conversation that was had, I want to go right back to like Trump's campaign team, just looking at some of these characters that Trump associated himself with, you know, the Paul Manaforts, uh, the Rudy Giuliani's. I mean, even, you know, as as, uh, you know, people that you, you mentioned earlier, all of these people have form. It's almost as if there wasn't a solitary, legitimate person <laughs> that sat at that table when there was that meeting with the foe, uh, you know, with the with the Russian uh, in Trump Tower, supposedly talking about was it adopting Russian babies or Ukrainian babies or something, and, and actually it t turned out to be far more serious than that. I mean, do you think Trump has the capacity to do anything that is legitimate, or or, or is is he just like a career criminal? And because all of those people that were involved in his campaign, they're either in in a state penitentiary now, or they're wearing an electronic tag. Yeah, well, the extraordinary thing is, you know, absolutely, you look at that initial crew, you know, his campaign manager, convicted, deputy campaign manager, convicted, first national security advisor, convicted, senior policy advisor, convicted, personal attorney, convicted, personal fixer, convicted. I mean, these are all people at, at a federal level. This isn't some state, you know, you didn't, right. you know, you did something odd registering your car. These are federal criminal convictions. So I, I, we haven't seen, even with Richard Nixon and the, the group around him and Watergate, we had never seen somebody, at least at, certainly at the early stages of their campaign administration, where there was such widespread demonstrated criminal behavior, proven criminal behavior. So I, I don't know. I, I think what happened was a result of the Republican mainstream, people who are qualified in the Republican Party, you know, who had come up through the ranks, who were destined for, you know, senior positions, none of them wanted anything to do with Trump. 
So, you know, they had aligned themselves with John Kasich or Marco Rubio or Ted Cruz, or all these other candidates. And when everybody looked at Trump, they're like, I don't I don't want to have anything to do with this man. So and there's plenty of the tweets and videos of them saying stuff like, yeah. That, you know, and, and, you know, it's like the saying, result. Oh, if you elect Trump, the Republican Party is finished and all this stuff. I mean, it's not as if it's not on on public record. Uh, and yet they they switch. So clearly his celebrity and his his power and also his skill, because, of course, he's a great marketeer and he's a great public speaker. And, you know, he's he is aside from being a nightmare, he's just a, he's very good on stage and, and on TV debates. And and they needed that, didn't they? The, the Republican Party kind of needed that star quality. Yeah, well, and the minute you have him nominated or, or gaining the becoming the nominee, if you want to remain a political player and maintain political power, you have to fall in line behind him because you know otherwise you're going to be ostracized. You can't, you know, go and, and you know, uh, uh, Justin Amash or you know, you look at people who have tried to leave. You know, their their power evaporates. There isn't a reasonable if you're a political player in the Republican Party and you see Trump gaining the nomination, whether you like it or not, you're going to fall in line and try and figure out how to navigate. I mean, they know he's crazy. They know he's, yeah. you know, nuts. But you, you can't, most of them clearly decided they had to try and find some way to operate within that. But you're right. I mean, he's an extraordinary marketeer. I mean, you look at what he did, the core of his business, whether it was real estate development, whether it was doing like boxing promotion with Don King, whether it was running a casino, whether it was going on, you know, some The Apprentice, it is all sort of bluster on the one hand and marketing and self promotion. Coincidentally, a lot of those things also happen to be things where there's a really high risk environment for illegal activity, for doing things where you have involvement of organized crime, where you have involvement of, you know, sort of corrupt valuations of things, whether you have sort of uh, uh, money laundering through illicit sources and places. The best way to do money laundering is when you find things where valuations are sort of squishy, where you can manipulate them. If I have dirty money, and I roll in and I overpay for a property and then sell it at a loss, then that some, you know, that launders the money in a legitimate way. There are all kinds of ways to play games with the core uh, gambling, right? Certainly, you know, that's another area on the high end where you can find ways to launder money. And Trump got in trouble, I think, if I recall correctly, with not adhering to regulations when it came to sort of financial reporting about the proceeds and the ins and outs of the financials of his gambling enterprise. So he just happens to find businesses which overlay very well with, you yeah. know, high risk for corruption. And again, does that is that by design? I don't know. Does it then should it be at all surprising that we see you know, alleged tax fraud that we see alleged connections when Eric Trump or whoever it is gets up and says, you know, our, our holdings in the Trump real estate empire disproportionately, you know, oligarchs or, or Russians or whatever the case may be. No, it's not surprising at all. So, uh, you know, does it, is he capable of running a clean enterprise if he wanted to? I, again, my opinion, no. I, who I, I don't think he's ever been asked to. I think he's too well developed to, to behave otherwise. But, uh, you know, think of it. He's not and, stupid, know, is he? No, this is the and other thing that people Cohen refer said. to him I mean, as being dumb. He, no, he really he's is. A, he's, a, he's a very shrewd operator. Yeah, and I think, you know, intelligence comes in a variety of forms. I think he's absolutely shrewd when it comes <laughs> to operating a business in a way that is, you know, you talk about the phrase having chalk on your feet, right? You're so close to the line, you know, that line on the, on the playing field where they've outlined it with yeah. chalk that you're getting, you're so close to the line that you have chalk on your shoes, right? But, you know, this is what Michael Cohen said, but, you know, said very articulately, what I think a lot of people understood. He is, he does operate like a mob boss. I mean, don't, don't write what you can say. Don't say what you can achieve with like a nod of the head and all the things, you know, his, he is very well versed in behaving in a way that conveys what he wants done whether immorally or illegally, in a way that doesn't create personal liability. And so, again, that is I, that is my observation and opinion. I think that is very much what, you know, when Michael Cohen testified, what he wrote in his book, says, yes, he operates that way. You know who else operates mm. that way? Crime it's also obvious, Peter, isn't it? It's like you don't have to be a rocket scientist to see what's going on. The way he uses code to connect with extremists or, or, or that, that kind of, you know, his proud boys and his oath keepers, you know, the, 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 that use of language. It's very subtle. I just want to ask, let's just go back to Russia for a moment, because you were investigating uh, Russia's desire to install a Russia-friendly president, like, what, four to six months before the 2016 election. Is that right? 
Yeah, uh, you so, know, it started so before that. So was Trump the mark? And was Trump always the mark? I don't know that Trump was specifically the mark. Look, do I, think, do I think Trump was a wittingly recruited asset who was doing the bidding of the Kremlin? I don't. I, you know, I don't think at all. I think Trump, like many other people who come across the Kremlin's radar, the Russian intelligence services are very good. So they cast a very wide net when people are coming and if they're influential, whether they are influential in business, whether they are influential in politics, whether they're influential in the media or any other space, the Russians are going to try and develop information about what makes them tick, whether or not they have any sort of information they can use to compromise them and try and cultivate a relationship there. So I think clearly the Russians understood when it sort of narrowed, started narrowing down the Republican Party on Trump, and certainly in contrast to Clinton, that if you are Putin or anybody in the sort of Russian political elite, it was clear that Russia is going to be better served, Russian interests, by a President Trump than they would have by a President Clinton. They saw a transactional president, potentially in the form of Trump. They saw somebody who had this odd affinity for, you know, dictators and strongmen. And on the other side, they saw Clinton, who had been very antagonistic in the past, who had, you know, derided the Russians for human rights abuses. I think they saw somebody that was going to be much more of a thorn in the side for Russia. So, you know, part of it is, it is not, if I were to assert, it was in Russia's interest to have President Trump over President Clinton, that's not really a contentious statement. That's not really a, there's not really a strong counter argument to that. So what I don't understand is why people can't just simply look at all the facts and say, yeah, of course Trump would be, the Russians would prefer Trump to Clinton. And that sure, based on who the Russians are, of course they would take steps and measures to try and help him and hurt her. I mean, Putin admitted it, didn't he? Yeah. Putin actually got up on the stage and said, yeah, I wanted Donald Trump to win. Right. And this shouldn't be contentious, yet somehow it is for a certain element of the right, which drives me nuts. But then the really important problem in my mind is that you had people who were engaging in behavior, you know, the ones I named, several of them criminally so, to take advantage of that assistance. And that, in my mind, that's the line. I mean, of course, foreign nations are going to try and influence our elections. They have for 200 plus years. But there shouldn't be a willingness on the part of any legitimate political party, certainly somebody running for president of the United States, sort of like actively cultivate and accept that. And again, to, to do that, you know, in many individual cases at a criminal level, that's this area where we just haven't seen anything like that. And, you know, he kept doing it. You know, yes, she like late, you know, late in his presidency when he was running as Biden, you know, uh, hopefully the PRC mm-hmm. can dig up dirt. Uh, you know, I hope they, so th- mm-hmm. this sort of willingness to engage with foreign hostile powers and maintain, using the media to communicate with them yeah using it right i just it, it the, the 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 cognitive dissonance to see and hear him doing that trump mm-hmm. and not have an immediate being repulsed by that behavior as an american i don't get it and I, to this day i fault the republican party about You know, it's one thing that domestic politics are going to get dirty. I mean, there's oppo research, there are horrible campaign ads, there's mudslinging. That's a nasty part of the American political process. But we've always kind of put a line at the border. Say, you know, Democrats, Republicans, do whatever you want, however dirty it is, swift boat, John Kerry. You can do all these miserable, nasty things and nobody likes it, but it's kind of part of the process. But we're not engaging and cultivating foreign nations to engage in that process with us, let alone are hostile, like primary hostile, you know, Russia and China. People are not, you know, it's not France. It's not, you know, Singapore. It's not, you know, Costa Rica. It's China. It's Russia. It are people that we, you know, have very adversarial relationships with in a global national security environment. And I, I, it's disappointing. And I, I, still, I still don't get it how that came to be. Around 5% of uh, current Republicans are you know, and this is like the extreme arm, the, the MAGA Republicans are, and I'm talking about Congress people and, and senators, are actually siding with Putin in the war against Ukraine. And they are absolutely not wanting there to be any more US funding of military equipment. But the, some of the language that they're starting to use is suggesting that, you know, Putin is the goody and not the baddie. And it's almost like they've fallen for the Russian propaganda that Putin presents to the Russian people saying that this is like a this is an essential peacekeeping mission. You know, we are liberating the Ukrainians from a, from the 
fascist Zelensky. Um, how do how do Republican senators and Congress people get to that point? You know, or, or are they just is there's just no help for them? Are they, uh, you know, do we just have to accept that there will always be kind of factions of a political party that are extremist? Well, I think it's certainly true that there will be factions that are extremist. I'm very concerned with, you know, the the I have not seen until the past few years such a close alignment between things that are very pro Kremlin in sort of their their nuance and their intent that I've seen playing out in a lot of places, you know, certainly with Trump, but also in some elements of the Republican Party. Now, there is certainly within the Senate, I think, when it comes to the national security perspective, you hear Republican senators saying, no, we need to support Ukraine. We need to stand up to Russian aggression. This is a Russian war of aggression. Ukraine is our ally and we're going to support them. So I think there's still a mainstream on the Senate side at a minimum Republican sense that pushing back against, you know, Russian authoritarianism is in the United States interest. But what I am concerned are, you know, this growing, you know, certainly in the in the House, but some also in the Senate, the sense that you see not only in Ukraine, but in other issues, the sort of odd alignment with Putin's talking point. And a lot of that goes to right wing media. And in particular, what I've seen on Fox and, you know, specifically Tucker mm-hmm. Carlson, some of the statements that he has made on his show, in my opinion, are very much like what you would hear coming out of a Kremlin propagandist mouth. And I don't understand where that's coming from. And you can trace back. I mean, you know, I write about it in the in, in, in my book and, and was concerned at the time. At some point, Trump makes before either as he's on the trail or right after he becomes president, makes these really odd comments about Montenegro. And he says, you know, Montenegro, they're really a small, aggressive country. They do something crazy. And all of a sudden we're in World War Three with the Russians. Well, the issue is that I guarantee you Trump couldn't find Montenegro on a map. And so why is it that he's saying this? And when you look at it, if I recall correctly, that was a question from, I think it was Tucker Carlson, maybe Sean Hannity, but that was something that he was set up by, again, this sort of odd group in right-wing media. And so the question is, when you see things that aren't, you know, clearly, squarely in America's interest, but are absolutely in Russia's interest, as as a counterintelligence professional, it causes me some curiosity, but also worry What's driving this line of attack? I mean, it isn't just strictly the isolationist bent, which is, you know, there's been a strong component of that in the United States for, for its entire existence. That, you know, we need to focus at home. We don't need to be involving ourselves, supporting with resources, let alone blood, you know, other interests abroad. Let's focus on here first. This isn't isolationism. It is a peculiar focus on Russian interests that really gives me a lot of concern, and I, you know, I, I don't understand it, and I, I haven't seen a reasonable explanation for it. And Russian media will take clips from Tucker Carlson's show and play them on the news in Russia to double down on the fact that, that the U.S. is supporting Russia in their cause to, to make the war seem more legitimate. I mean... This First Amendment kind of really does allow people, you know, enemies of the state like Tucker Carlson to freely work for the enemy and get away with it. I mean, you know, there are I mean, I'm from a country that would wouldn't just wouldn't allow for it. It's still a free, you know, social democracy, but the reality is that if you are you, you know, if 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 you went on the news and started spouting stuff like that, you'd be taken away in handcuffs. I mean, it's how do you feel about the way that the U.S. has has changed in as much as the many of the amendments, not just the First Amendment, are now being kind of weaponized? You know, whereas even to be able to own a firearm used to be a musket, and now it's a semi-automatic machine gun. I mean, things are changing and not for the better. And so the, the, the structure of the U.S., t- to my mind, certainly as a European, is that it's becoming so uncivilized I mean, a six-year-old boy shot a teacher in a in a school in Missouri earlier in the week. I mean, I just I I, I'm, I'm, I don't even have the words, Peter. Yeah, it's horrific, and I mean, I think a lot of it. I I think the average American looks at gun violence in America and says this is tragic and horrific and horrible, but at the same time, it seems as a as a nation, we seem unable to get to a point of what I would consider sensible gun control reform. I think you're absolutely right that you know, you can't look at when it comes to the Constitution, when it comes to the Bill of Rights, you can't look at sort of those as being static things. And there's, you know, by design, I think the founders recognize that they shouldn't be static, that there should be some evolution. But I, I, I don't 
it is hard to argue against your proposition that the interpretation of American law and American rights have not kept pace with the evolution of everything, technology, information, C- movement, culture, yeah. um, availability of right culture, availability of weapons, the nature of weapons themselves. So I don't think any reasonable, I, I think it is hard to make an argument that if you took the founders and if you set them down today and you said, okay, we're going to take you out to the range, here's an M4, an AR-15, a semi-automatic rifle in here, a couple of, you know, 30 round magazines and, you know, see what you could do that they would say, you know, and okay, we're going to drive you out in a car to get to the range. And that they would not look at all this technology and say, okay, so you're saying to have this weapon that I can shoot 60 people in under, you know, two, three minutes, I can buy with less training and licensing requirement than this marvelous device that you drove me out to the range that you have to go to courses, that you have to sit down and you get licensed and you have to carry insurance for. And that if you have any sort of, you know, like um, a reason you shouldn't drive that car, that they're going to take your license away that you have all this regulation on this wonderful vehicle that you've invented, but you have absolutely no regulation on this <laughs> device that was designed by you know evil geniuses to fight wars. I, it, it doesn't make any sense to me. So th- th- there is an imbalance there. I just, I, I, I don't understand how, and again, it's gotten to the point where th- there's nobody reasonable in America that would look at that six-year-old bringing the gun and killing their teacher and say, that's all right. And the fact that we can't move from that universal, near universal sentiment to saying, okay, there's a pretty straightforward, easy way to stop that and to stop all these other mass shooting events that we've had that nobody else in the world outside of a, you know, wartime environments are experiencing and have that create some sort of unreasonable restriction on your rights. And it's become so politicized, I, 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 just mourn every time there is an event like this. I have little no hope that there's going to be sensible reform anytime soon. Yeah, and same. I, I don't know what that says. It, but it's for me, it's about civility. And I think, you know, I can connect gun ownership to January 6th. I can connect Donald Trump and his, you know, the, the loss of the separation of powers, of course, you know, between, between the government departments, the executive branch. And that's why he's criticizing Biden and thinking that Biden is, you know, running the Justice Department as if it's his own personal lawyer, because that's how Trump ran it. And so, you know, without that kind of four year period or six years, because he's still talking, you know, still saying this stuff, still singing these same hymns, it, it has devalued the United States, not just within its own borders, but around the world. And so for somebody like yourself, and I really do see this contrast. Somebody who, you know, started in the military, was, was you know, well-educated, was, you know, lived all around the world, who's given your life to public service, to see these organizations that maintain civility in the U.S. collapse because of one man's ego who, who was compromised. And probably if he was impeached properly the first time, this would have saved an awful lot of bother. It must be very frustrating for somebody like yourself, who is really an excellent example of a, of a hardworking American, that phrase is used all the time, to see your, your country become uncivil around you, because you have suffered at the hands of, of this movement and this division in politics and angry Republicans criticizing you when you're the wrong guy, you're on the right team. Yeah, it's hard to see. And I mean, I think, you know, I struggle with the question about one, how much of this was done by Trump? You know, at first, I absolutely agree with you. I mean, the damage that was done is lasting. The the events of the Trump presidency, you know, cast shadows long into the future. This is not something simply like, oh, you know, Trump's gone, America elected Biden and great, you know, back to business as usual. No, it, it, it there are ramifications of what he did, not only within the United States, but when it comes to our relationships abroad, our relationship to our Western allies, our intelligence, you know, on the intel side, our intelligence. Well, look at Brazil four days ago, the storm uh, right. of Congress I, in yes, Brazil. And, I mean, yes, it's and the got impact Trump's on fingerprints all over it authoritarian regimes and the blueprint and tacit support that they believe may or may not exist in the U.S. Yes. I mean, it was deeply destabilizing in a way that continues. But the other thing I struggle with is, you know, I, I, I do agree with your, a lot of your characterizations of Trump, but I also struggle with the fact that it's not just Trump. I mean, the American population elected Trump. Even after seeing four years of administration, you know, he was not that far away from being reelected. I mean, there were tens and tens and yeah. tens of millions of Americans who watched 2016 to 2020 and said, yeah, give me four more years of that. 
So as much as I look at Trump and the destruction that he and those around him wrought on the government, on the executive branch, on the United States, on our relationships abroad, I can't get away from the fact that there are a real significant population within the United States who support that. Now, are they adequately informed about what exactly happened? How many of those folks either didn't pay attention to the news or got their news from Fox News or OAN or all these other places that were not presenting at all an objective depiction of what was occurring? And therefore, if they actually knew what had occurred, they might have been like, oh, my God, no, we, we can't do this again. How much of this is it is hard if you buy into a contentious issue and put your marker down. Admitting you're wrong is a hard thing to do. I mean, there's a reason denial is such a power. You know, we, we've got people going, you know, the Greek playwrights talk about denial. I mean, denial is a powerful human emotion and how you overcome that and how you manage that and how it looks as it plays out when, you know, it's increasingly denial in the face of just utter unreality is nothing new to the human condition. But I, I can't help but be concerned. Does the, if at whatever point Trump is no longer a force in the political uh, arena in the United States, what does this sentiment and movement reconstitute itself as? What emerges from it? And that's something I don't, you know, again, it worries me because I, yes, I think Trump in many ways was sort of a unique force and factor in American political history. But the reality is that showman found something that resonated within, again, tens and tens and tens of millions of Americans. Some of it was horrific misogyny and racism. And you see people like Nick Fuentes and white supremacists are getting invaded. Some of that was that. But there is a huge chunk of lower middle class, white, blue collar, rather America that thought he spoke to something that they felt wasn't getting expressed, that represented them. And figuring out what that is and finding a way to responsibly address that is the challenge for, you know, American political life going forward. You had a lot of interactions with uh, General Flynn, didn't you? Uh, you kind of interviewed him. You you tried to catch him out using some of his own language when he was communicating with, with the Russians. Are you aware of what he's doing now and his movement now to so-called save America and the way he travels the country and is trying to radicalize people? And, and how much does that concern you? I'm aware of some of it. I mean, I, you know, certainly the statements that he made around January 5th and, you know, trying to, you know, his proposition, I think there was a White House meeting in December, mid-December of 2020, where he was advocating, you know, potentially using the military to seize voting machines. I mean, these are these are absolutely antithetical to you know, American democracy. And I think some of what he's doing afterwards, I, I haven't followed closely enough to be able to tell you the big question. The I can't tell you the answer to the big question in my mind, which is, does he be actually believe the things that he is spouting off to these groups, the absolute distrust of the existing sort of government order in the Biden administration and changing it and Christian nationalism and all these things? Or is this just grift? That he actually knows what he's doing. He's taking advantage of people who are going to pay $10 a ticket to show up and $20 for a T-shirt and you know, fifteen dollars for an autograph book, and it's all a way to stay in the spotlight and maintain an income stream. I don't. I, I think both of those are possible, but I certainly think when you look at what he's doing, yeah, it's unfortunately not surprising given sort of the path that he appeared to be on when he entered the White House. But it's dangerous. I mean, he you have a senior military three-star officer who was the head of the Defense Intelligence Agency, who was a decorated combat veteran in the Special Forces community, you know, a very successful career as a junior officer. And, you know, was made his way up to national security advisor and now is just saying crazy things and saying in the context of, you know, military veterans, some of whom are, you know, willing to look and say, well, this guy was a three star general. He, you know, combat vet, strong on fighting back against Islamic terrorism. Let me hear what he has to say. And yeah, I'm concerned. I think it's dangerous. Because I do feel, you know, when we look ahead, you know, how might this end? Um, you know, Trump's organization has just been done for tax fraud, as we said earlier, but it doesn't affect Donald Trump, the man. And there aren't really punishments for, you know, white collar crime, even if you have almost brought down your entire country in the process. It, it must be kind of frustrating. It certainly is for me. But, you know, you were in the inner circle for this to, to know that 
I just really want to ask you, do you think that justice will eventually catch up with the, the, the former president? Or do you think that, uh, like a lot of people such as him, they will continue to get away with it? Well, it's a great question. I think it depends on how you define justice. I mean, I think one of the things that I found working in the FBI in the context of the criminal justice system is frequently enough, you arrived at a point where you knew somebody had done something wrong and you also knew that you're never going to be able to prove it. So the sense of the, the moral indignation of knowing, I know you broke the law. I know you victimized all these people in whatever way, shape or form. And I know that the criminal justice system is never going to be able to hold you accountable for that. If you think in justice more broadly, if you think in terms of justice of whether or not how history is going to look at somebody, whether or not how a political system is going to look at somebody, I think we have to, if you frame your satisfaction of justice merely on the criminal justice system, you're going to be disappointed time and time and time again. I do take some heart in the fact that, you know, when you look at all of these overwhelming number of candidates that Trump supported in the midterm elections who lost, I think there's some measure of political justice there. I think people looked at his behavior and said, enough, you know, across the nation. I do think there is going to be, I know there are probably going to be things where I think, and certainly in some cases hope, that these alleged violations of law that Trump gets charged for that are not going to be charged just because it's so, our system makes that hard to do, appropriately so. And so the question is, you know, is, is looking at that in a way to see, okay, whatever comes or doesn't come there, there's probably not going to be, it is not going to be equal to what he actually did just because the standard of proof and the way the justice system is set up, we can't match it. But is there a benefit to you know things like the January 6th committee? Is there benefit to just all this other activity that is getting the information out about who he is? I hope so. I mean, I have to try and be hopeful. You know, you hope for the best and prepare for just horrible disappointment. But I have to continue to hope that of all these things, and I do take some hope based on the sort of results of the midterm election, that people are turning away from Trump. Now, it hasn't stopped all these crazy MAGA folks in the Republican Congress from getting outside influence in the committee assignments. But I think there is this big, slow ship of American democracy is kind of starting to turn away from Trump. At least I want to hope that. We'll see what happens. Okay. Peter Strzok, thank you very much for joining us today. I'm Anthony Davis. Please subscribe to The Weekend Show on YouTube or as an audio podcast. And don't forget the 5-Minute News daily podcast, which drops every morning so you can hear me tell you what's happening around the world while you make your morning coffee. Join me next week with a brand new special guest and three more factual news stories to discuss on The 5-Minute News Weekend Show with Midas Touch. Midas Touch.